Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to worship. Thank you for joining by watching this video, and may it give you encouragement and strength for the week ahead. Our opening hymn today came to William Merrill, a Presbyterian pastor, as he was traveling back to Chicago on a Lake Michigan steamer sometime around 1911. The original title was Rise Up, O Men of God, and it was intended as a call to men to become more fully involved in serving the church. However, a problem arose when the whole church adopted the hymn as a call to both men and women. Since then, numerous changes have been proposed to rectify this situation, with the word saints being the most widely accepted substitution for the word men. So who is a saint? Well, if you've been listening to Jacob over the last few years, you know the answer to that. Actually, if you paid attention to who Paul calls saints in the New Testament, you already knew the answer to that. The saints are the body of Christ. They are those who are a part of Christ's kingdom here on earth. Christ's kingdom is the church in the here and now. That's us. Yeah, I know, I don't really feel like a saint most of the time either. Actually, I'm not sure I ever feel like a saint. Yet, I love God, and I'm committing to, committed to following the way of Jesus to the best of my ability. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you too are committed to following the way of Jesus. I'm a saint. You are a saint. So, together, let's rise up. And as we are going to sing in the first verse of this song, let's ask God's help to have done with lesser things, to give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. <laughs> Please join me in prayer. Lord, you are my rock and my strength. When I grow weary, let me turn my thoughts and my prayers to you. When I am discouraged, restore my faith in you. Let me always trust in your promises, Lord, and let me draw strength from those promises and from your unending love for me. And we ask these things as we say the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. saw the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear those who look upon him are radiant and never be ashamed and never be ashamed this poor man cried Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies, the Son of God surrounds his saints, he will deliver them, he will deliver them. Exalt his name 
give you everything. You give you everything. Today we're going to be reflecting on a subject that is of utmost importance. It really is. It's difficult, if not impossible, for me to overstate the importance of this subject. And I can imagine some people saying, well, you say that nearly every week, and if I don't say it, perhaps I should, because these moments that we have together to reflect on these important realities is an extraordinarily valuable time that we have together. And I believe, as I do each week, that these subjects have the potential to transform us in important ways and in far-reaching ways, because we know that our lives touch other lives in direct and indirect ways, and we are called to be transformed. We are called to reflect the image of the one who created us. So today I want to talk about becoming the children of God we were created to be. Becoming the children of God we were created to be. For many of us, we look at God and we recognize the transcendence of God. We recognize the beauty of God. We recognize the perfection of God. We recognize the goodness of God. And when we view ourselves, we recognize that while we are created in God's image, number one, we are not God. And number two, we recognize that there is a great distance in terms of our character and our condition between us and God. Now, God is always present all around us. There's nowhere we can go that we won't be in God's presence. But in terms of our condition, we recognize that we have a long way to go so that we can more fully actualize, so that we can more fully become the children of God we were created to be. We have a number of resources that are available to us. And above all, I believe that the greatest resource is the teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the one who shows us what it means to be a child of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one in whom there is a perfect unity between humanity and divinity in terms of will and volition and purpose and mission. Jesus is the one who came to fully embody the very purposes the very essence, the very being of God. And as we look to Jesus, and as we are transformed into Jesus's likeness by conforming ourselves to his teachings, then we do in fact, in fact, and in reality, and in existence, in an existential way, we are becoming the children of God we are created to be. One of the most powerful insights into the process of transformation and the ways that we can, one of the ways we can be intentional about that process comes from a very short passage. This comes from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21. This passage shows up in a number of different contexts throughout the Gospels, and it is simple, and yet it is infinitely profound. You're familiar with it. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For many of us, we want to change our condition. We want to change our hearts. And we realize that through habitual actions and habitual thoughts, through the context and the communities in which we find ourselves, it feels like over time it's difficult for us to change the condition of our hearts. It's difficult for us to change the way we feel about certain things. It's difficult for us to change even what we want or desire. For a long time, I read this passage in reverse. I read it as where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. So if we look at where our treasure is, then we will recognize the condition of our hearts. For many of us, we look at where we place our treasures, and in some ways we would rather not know what the actual condition is. Of our hearts is. But if we'll begin to see this in its proper light, we'll recognize that we have access to a very important tool, a very important practice that will empower us to become the children of God that we are. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, what is our treasure? Our treasure is that which we care about most. And one of the things we have to begin to do is look at what we actually care about most. 
For many of us, and I know this includes me, there are a number of things that we would like to think we care about most. There are a number of things that we would like to think is where our treasure is. As we begin to take notice and do some inventory, we recognize that that's not actually where our treasure is. But that doesn't mean that we can't be intentional about where we begin to place our treasure. And as we become intentional about where we place our treasure, then our heart is changed. And so if today I begin to devote my treasure, to place my treasure in an area where it has not been placed, already I'm in the process. And so even by tomorrow, there has been progress toward becoming the child of God that I was created to be. So let's look at some of those areas where we place our treasure. First of all, our treasure is that to which we give our attention, that to which we give our attention. One of the subtle mistakes that I know that I make, and I imagine that a number of you make, is that there are things that we care deeply about, and we are called to care deeply about those things, those persons, those relationships. And we do, in fact, care a great deal about those persons, those relationships, and those things to which we have been called to place our treasure. But if we're not careful, our attention will go toward worrying about those relationships, those people, those things that we are called to care for. And if we're not careful, that worry in some ways is interpreted to us on some level as a demonstration, as evidence that we actually care about these other things. But that's not the best use of our treasure. If our worry has our attention, then it's not the things that we are worried about that are getting our attention. So we want to be careful that we're giving our attention to the things that we care so deeply about. Now, we have limited energy. God is the infinite one. We are finite. God is the transcendent one. We have limitations. We only have so much mental energy. I just want us to be aware, though, that we can be intentional about where we give our attention. Now, there are times and like you, I have my moments of mindless entertainment. And during this pandemic, I know that many of us have just binge watched a number of shows and there are several series that some of us have watched. And I have to confess, I'd heard other people doing this and it had not yet applied to me until this very week. I caught myself staying up past midnight and beyond because I was hooked. I was giving my attention to this series that I just, it seemed like I couldn't turn my attention away from it. Now, here's the interesting part. It happened to be one of those series that really was awakening my mind to different possibilities. This wasn't just mindless entertainment. So one of the things we can do for those of us who enjoy entertainment is even begin to be selective about our entertainment. Is it enriching? Is it edifying? Is it inspiring? Is it liberating? Is it instructive? Does it raise our awareness? And so I just want us to consider one of the ways we can change our hearts, transform our hearts, is by placing our treasure, our attention, intentionally on those areas that will cultivate that change. What gets our time? Not everything that gets our time is getting our focused attention. Are we giving enough time to those things that we are called to care about? Are we giving the kind of time we need to those who are in our lives, who are the first parts of our vocation. We are called first beyond our jobs, careers, or anything else. We are called to love those whom God has placed in our lives. For those of us who have children, and I am convicted of this, sometimes I can give my attention to things that I'm called to give my attention and time to, but I don't give the kind of time I need to give to my children. We have to be intentional about where it is that we give our time. I believe we need to give some time to whatever is recreational for us, that which is recreational to us. Barbara Brown Taylor, one of the world's most well-known preachers, she was considered at one point one of the top 15 English-speaking preachers. In one of her books, she had someone ask her a question that struck her, and, and, and she offers it as a question we should ask ourselves. What is saving our lives right now? What is it that's saving our lives right now? Each one of us has various demands on us. 
For some of us, we're dealing with some personal physical ailments. For some of us, we're concerned about a loved one. For some of us, we are engaged in full-time care of a loved one. For some of us, we're in the throes of our careers and our vocations. We're trying to make a living. We're trying to save up enough money so that we don't outlive our income. For some of us, we're trying to raise our children to be kind, compassionate followers of Jesus. We all have various circumstances that are taking place in our lives. But I think we need to take time as well for recreation, for recreation, that which gives us life. For some of us, we enjoy reading a good book. For some of us, we do enjoy spending time watching a good movie. For those of us who are able, we enjoy a nice walk just for the fun of it, not for the discipline of the exercise. But I do believe that we need to give treasure to our treasure, which is part of our time to recreation. Who or what gets our service? Or what or whom are we serving? One of the ways that we offer our treasure is by serving others. And serving just means love in action. What are we doing for others? More than giving our attention, more than giving our time, which is a form of doing. But in what ways are we being intentional about loving others? In what ways are we being intentional about serving God? One of the greatest ways to serve God is to serve God's children. One of the greatest ways to love God is to love God's children. To whom have we been called to serve? In what ways are we giving our lives, our attention, our time, our service to other people? It's important for us to take a step back from time to time and ask, am I fulfilling my ministry? That's what service is. We're called to be servants. We're called to be ministers. Every person who is a member of the body of Christ, sometimes translated part of the body of Christ, membership in the body of Christ is not an institutional membership. It doesn't mean that our names are on a book somewhere and we can say that we have membership of a particular church. Membership, properly understood, means that we are a part of the body of Christ and each member is called to service. Now, for some of us, we would say, well, I'm in a place in my health. There's nothing I can do for other people. Let me assure you, if we have even the slightest soundness of mind, we can be in prayer for other people. And never underestimate the power of prayer. A number of years ago, I wrote to a monk at a monastery, a Christian monk, and I realized the importance of his ministry. His ministry, his service was to pray for people. Some of us can make meals and, and, and deliver those to people who are in need. For some of us, we can make a phone call. That's our service. We can reach out to people who may be lonely, those for whom those walls are beginning to close in. There are a number of ways that we can serve, but we need to ask ourselves, in what way are we giving the treasure of service to those to whom God is calling us? And then we can also consider our financial resources. That is obviously one of our treasures. For many of us, we have online banking accounts and there are apps and there are ways of seeing where our finances are going. I invite you, and it's tough for me as well, to look at where our finances are going. I've noticed in particular seasons, and obviously not so much recently, but there was a time when I was in graduate school and Valerie was in graduate school and we had small children and we were often tired and even though we were on a very short budget that a lot of our resources were going toward takeout food. And I realized at one point that it was, it was a little bit too much and then things that certainly didn't need our income like going through a drive through co coffee shop, you know, coffee for $2.50 up to $5 now, that can add up over time. Now, I'm not shaming anyone or myself for the occasional indulgence. What I am saying, though, is sometimes things can be more out of balance that we realize, that we're not able to give to some of the things that we would like to give because our financial resources are going to other places or we're just not being intentional about it. And so where are the areas that we are intentional about offering our financial resources for no other reason than to offer it to God for God's purposes. This is not a way of getting God to do things for us. This is a recognition that one of the ways that we can serve God, one of the ways that we can love God is by offering our financial resources to a degree of sacrifice to the point that it costs us something. It may cost us 
that other cup of coffee. It may cost us another night of takeout or another visit to a restaurant that we so enjoy. And again, this is not any heavy handed kind of discipline. This is a joyful recognition that we can offer our treasure in the way of our finances to God's work in a number of different capacities. And then finally, don't forget to treasure yourself. Don't forget to treasure yourself. For many of us, we go around thinking that humility is this, oh, woe is me, and I'm just a worm in the dirt, or, you know, I, God is God and I am not, and, and I'm just, oh, oh, woe is me. And God doesn't desire us to see ourselves that way. We need to remember who we truly are. We are children of God, loved infinitely by God. We need to treasure ourselves. When we find ourselves doing something that is contrary to our true nature, we don't have to beat up on ourselves. We acknowledge it. We turn away from it. We change that behavior. We invest our treasure in ways that will enable and empower us to become the children of God that we truly are. You see, it's not that we're becoming something that we're not. We're becoming who we truly are. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. Every person on this planet, past, present, and future, is a child of God, loved infinitely by God. One of the greatest ways we can begin to become and actualize the people we were created to be is to realize that's who we truly are. All we need to do is to become, to actualize who we truly are. My prayer for us today is that we will continually become the children of God we were created to be, to recognize that we can cooperate, we can be a part of that co-creation, we can be a part of that process in an intentional way by making sure that we are directing our treasure, our attention, our time, our service, and ourselves, that we can perceive ourselves as the treasures we are. And in so doing, as we recognize that we can place our treasure and direct our treasure in the ways that they need to be directed, we will in fact become that reality of the children of God that we are. That's my prayer for you, and that's my prayer for me, and that's my prayer for all of God's children. Amen. The one who revealed what it means to be a child of God entered into human history. And for some three years, he walked and lived in an intentional way among his disciples. And his disciples had come a long way in the process of becoming, and they had a long way to go. I believe the one who walked this earth 2,000 years ago continues to walk alongside us. And the progress we have made has been inspired and has been made possible through the presence and through the example of the one we call Savior, the one we call Christ. He sees how far we've come, and he's aware of how far we have to go, and he will be with us every step of the way. And so he wanted us to remember that he would always be with us and that his love for us is unconditional. And so on that night in that room with his disciples, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you partake of it in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ given for you and given for me. This is the blood of the new covenant the love of Christ, God's covenant of eternal love given for you and given for me. These are the gifts of God for each and every one of us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. And now may the love of God that surpasses all understanding 
the love that entered into human history, the love that empowers us to become the children of God we were created to be, the love of God that loves us precisely where we are, the love of God that will never merely leave us where we are, the love of God that compels and inspires us to recognize who we truly are, children of God, now and forever. May that love guard and sustain our hearts this day and forevermore. Amen. You're the light in this darkness, you're the hope.